So in this video, I want to talk about the adverse effects of diuretics and how we can make sense out of it by applying our knowledge on kidney physiology. So we're going to talk about several electrolyte disbalances that diuretics can trigger. We're going to first talk about potassium. So to understand how diuretics influence the potassium levels, we obviously need to understand where is potassium reabsorbed. And as most of the electrolytes, it's absorbed predominantly in the proximal convoluted tubule. That's where most of the reabsorption happens. But this reabsorption is paracellularly, so not via transporters. Same in the thick ascending limb, also paracellularly. And then in the connecting tubule collecting duct, we have some potassium secretion happening. And although this is just a small amount, it is highly regulated and it depends on how much sodium is delivered to the collecting duct. What happens here is whatever sodium is delivered to the collecting duct, it gets in via the ENAC channel, but once it's taken up into the collecting duct cell, it leaves behind a negative charge because we take out the sodium. So we have negative charge now in the tuber. Well, there's also this ROM K channel and obviously the negative charge is a attractor for positively charged potassium ions. So the more sodium we're going to take up, the more potassium we will lose in the tubular fluid. Now let's go back to our overview picture to see where this happens. So this happens in the collecting duct. What that really means is that any diuretic that gives us more sodium into, in the tubular fluid reaching the collecting duct will have the effect that I just described on potassium. Meaning the more sodium is going to be delivered here, the more potassium you're going to lose because all the sodium again leaves behind this negative charge. So you're going to lose potassium and therefore we're going to have as an adverse effect hypokalemia. So which of the diuretics are going to have this adverse effect? Well, all of them that work proximal to the collecting duct, thiazides, loops, and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So they will all result in hypokalemia. Now, if you look at the potassium sparing diuretics, well, it should be obvious that th they are going to have the opposite adverse effect because they just block here the ENAC channel directly or indirectly. So there will be no positive charge and no potassium loss. And that's actually where the name comes from. The name comes from an adverse effect. They are potassium sparing because they hold on to the potassium in contrast to all the other diuretics. They all waste potassium. So sometimes we call all the other diuretics potassium wasting diuretics. And then this name makes sense. Those are potassium sparing diuretics. So we can just summarize all diuretics working proximal to the collecting tubule will have hypokalemia as an adverse effect. And again, if you block ENAC directly or indirectly, as we do with our potassium sparing diuretics, we're not going to lose the potassium. Now let's go back to our overview picture. And what we're going to realize is that I mentioned already this negative charge that the sodium ions leave behind when they're going to get into the collecting duct via the ENAC channel. Well, another positively charged ion is our protons. And the same way the potassium is going to be attracted by these negative charges, the protons are going to be attracted. Therefore, we will lose our protons the same mechanistic way that we lose our potassium. It should come with no surprise that anything that acts proximal to the collecting duct and therefore delivers more sodium to the collecting duct would lose potassium as well as protons. And therefore, for those drugs, we're going to have metabolic alkalosis and an adverse effect. So this would account for the loop diuretics and the thiazide. And obviously the potassium spurring diuretics would show the opposite because here we're not going to take up the sodium in the collecting duct because this 
um, channel is blocked and therefore we're going to end up with metabolic acidosis because we're going to waste less protons. This is, however, not a real clinically relevant adverse effect that you're going to see, but it is a theoretical adverse effect that could potentially happen with a potassium sparing diuretic. Now, one question you might have, why didn't I list here the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors? They are missing on this page in contrast to the previous where I showed you the adverse effects on potassium. So the reason is because carbonic anhydrase inhibitors block carbonic anhydrase, as the name already implies. So if you block this enzyme here, you cannot even provide the protons that you would lose. In addition, we need to realize that the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors already in the proximal convoluted tubule mess around with acid-base balances, in particular with bicarbonate. So let's look first how bicarbonate is handled in the kidney. So the freely filtered bicarbonate will get reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. That's, the, that's where the majority of bicarbonate will get reabsorbed, as I've also indicated here. There's a little bit in the thick ascending limb, but basically below 5%, and that's about it. And there's a little bit regulation also in the collecting duct. But so when the bicarbonate is freely filtered, it will get together with protons that are provided via the NHE, form carbonic acid, and the carbonic anhydrase is going to split it up in water and CO2. The CO2 filters is going to diffuse freely into the cell, where carbonic anhydrase again regenerates carbonic acid and going to make us again bicarbonate and protons. And the bicarbonate then gets in, is reabsorbed via this NBC, the sodium bicarbonate co-transporter. So you can see here, this is kind of a two-step process. First, the bicarbonate gets with protons together to carbonic acid, and then kind of they get split up and fit together again with the carbonic anhydrase, and then the bicarb can get reabsorbed. Now you can see also how carbonic anhydrase inhibitors will influence this process. Because if you're not going to have carbonic anhydrase, well, then you're not going to reabsorb bicarbonate as efficiently. And therefore, you're going to block sodium bicarb reabsorption. If you're not going to reabsorb the bicarb, you're going to lose it in the urine. And therefore, you're going to have as an adverse effect metabolic acidosis. So that's the opposite that you would have probably predicted. But please remember, first of all, in the collecting duct, we cannot even provide the protons. And second, our carbonic anhydrase inhibitor directly affect bicarb reabsorption. So we will first need to look what they directly do in terms of acid-base balance. And they block bicarbonate reabsorption. I also want to mention a very important point. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are now rarely used as a diuretic. And why? because they give us as a side effect metabolic acidosis. Why is that a problem? Because if you have acidosis, you have a lot of protons. So protons are everywhere. They're gonna get into the cell. And then if you have protons all around, the NHE will not depend anymore on the protons made by the carbonic anhydrase. It will just take whatever is around from the acidosis. Therefore, at one point, this limits the efficacy dramatically. Next, I'm gonna look at calcium and see how the different diuretics affect calcium levels. And the two diuretics that really have an effect on calcium levels are loop diuretics, which I've abbreviated here as LD, and the thiazides. Unfortunately, we have to consider different mechanisms for calcium reabsorption to predict the adverse effect of these diuretics. So calcium is again also the majority is taken up in the proximal convoluted tubule via a paracellular process, also a little bit in the thick ascending limb. And then there's a regulated transporter, trip B5, which sits in the distal convoluted tubule, which takes up also a little bit. Now, to 
predict the adverse effect or the effect of loop diuretics on calcium, we need to look locally. So where do loops act in the loop? And they block this NKCC. So what happens is that normally when the NKCC is working, it takes up sodium chloride and potassium. But there's also this ROM K channel. So the potassium really leaks back right immediately after being taken up. So it leaks back. And because it leaks back, we have all this potassium around here and we have a lot of positive charges. So what do you think is going to happen when we have this tube here with all those positive charges? Well, it will repel other positively charged ions and in particular calcium and magnesium. So normally when we have the NKCC working, sodium chloride potassium is taken up and potassium goes right back out. Therefore, this drives calcium and magnesium reabsorption paracellular. Now imagine if we block NKCC with loop diuretics. Well, then we're not going to have these positive charges and no calcium and magnesium will be repelled and less will be reabsorbed. Therefore, we're going to lose calcium and therefore loop diuretics will have hypocalcemia as an adverse effect. Now, for the thiazide diuretics, the other diuretic class that has an effect on calcium, we have to think a little bit differently. So generally, with any diuretic, we will get volume depletion, and a process called diuretic breaking is going to kick in. That means that in the proximal convoluted tuber, we're going to try to take back more sodium and water to kind of restore our sodium balance. Then. Whenever we are going to have volume depletion, we're going to take back more sodium and water in the proximal tuber and also more calcium. So we try to recompensate this diuretic effect. And therefore, the adverse effect that we're going to see with thiazide is going to be increased calcium reabsorption. And this will lead to hypercalcemia. If you would ask now, well, wouldn't we see this with any diuretic? And wouldn't this adverse effect that I wrote in here be applicable for any diuretic? Yes, generally it's true, but we really only see it with the thiazides because the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, the potassium spurring diuretics, they are probably not potent enough to see enough of, of this diuretic breaking effect that it really has an influence on the calcium reabsorption. Why we see with the loop diuretics an opposite effect has really to do with that they act in the thick ascending limb and the thick ascending limb is here the place where we need to look in to understand how they affect calcium absorption. So unfortunately calcium is not straightforward. There are two different mechanisms, but I always think about them. You have to think locally. So locally first start with what happens where the diuretics act. So for the loop, we look at the thick ascending limb. And for the thiazide, we're just going to apply a, a mechanism involved in diuretic breaking that has to do with general volume depletion and that the proximal convoluted tuber tries to reabsorb more after kind of this, the diuresis has kicked in. Now for magnesium, let's first look at where is magnesium reabsorbed because here is really a huge contrast to the other electrolytes. So, so far, we, whatever we discussed is going to be the majority is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tuber. But that's not, that's not true for magnesium. As you're going to see here with my little diagram, the majority is going to be reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb. So it's not the proximal tuber, but both is paracellularly. And then we have one regulated transporter, trip and 6 M for magnesium. And this is ha happening in the distal convoluted tuber. We already mentioned a mechanism in the thick ascending limb that is responsible for taking back calcium and magnesium. And it should come without any surprise that whatever the loop diuretics did with calcium, they're going to do the same with magnesium. That's exactly true. And I'm just going to repeat this mechanism. So generally the NKCC takes back sodium chloride and potassium, but the potassium leaks right back out. So we're going to accumulate positive charges. And these positive charges are going to repel other positive charges. 
and that's how calcium and magnesium gets repelled and gets reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb. If we use now a loop diuretic, we block this effect, there's no positive charges, there's no repel of calcium and magnesium, therefore we're going to lose calcium and magnesium. We are disgusted for calcium, now we're going to have the same for magnesium. So those, the loop diuretics are going to have hypomagnesemia as an adverse effect. Now thiazides have also hypomagnesemia as an adverse effect. So in contrast to calcium here, it doesn't run in two different directions. However, the mechanism behind the hypomagnesemia is unfortunately different. So let's look here at this overview picture to understand how the thiazides affect magnesium. Thiazides block the NCC. And here, close to the NCC, is this trip M6 channel, this magnesium channel that takes up magnesium in the distal convoluted tumor. The mechanism is not completely clear, but it turns out when you block NCC, the trip M6 is also not working. It gets kind of downregulated. But fact is, if you take out that, for some reason, this is also not working. Therefore, you can predict we're going to have this thiazide hypomagnesemia. Same as for the loop diuretics. It's just a different mechanism behind the hypomagnesemia. The last predictable adverse effect that I want to discuss is the effect on uric acid. If you have too much uric acid, this can be a problematic adverse effect because it can lead to gout. Now, how can we predict this and how do our diuretics affect uric acid levels? All the diuretics act in the from the tubular side, so they need to get into the tubular fluid to work on their respective transporters. How do they get in the tubular fluid? They all get in the tubular fluid via this transporter called OAT, stands for organic anion transporter. Now uric acid is also an acid that is transported via this OAT, and therefore if you're going to have this diuretics around, no matter which one you're going to have, you're going to compete with uric acid for this transporter. Therefore, we're going to have higher levels of uric acid with most of the diuretics. But you're really going to only see it with the thiazides and the loop diuretics. And so they lead to hyperuricemia, probably because they are the more effective ones. Now I just want to add a couple of miscellaneous adverse effects that you cannot easily predict. So both loops and thiazide lead to hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia. And the loops also have as an adverse effect ototoxicity. That's a very famous adverse effect. There's also NKCC in the inner ear. And that's why I see the ototoxicity. For the potassium spurring, for spironolactone, so the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, we're also going to see gynecomastian impotence. And this is really due to that the spironolactin is not only an antagonist at mineralocorticoid receptor, it kind of has some off-target effect. It has also effects on the androgen receptor, so it's also an androgen receptor antagonist, and that's why you see this adverse effect. So to finish up, I just want to have here this overview slide with all the different adverse effects, predictable adverse effects on the different electrolytes. So remember, potassium and protons kind of go along. The only exception is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor because they have really effects on bicarbonate reabsorption based on their mechanism of action. Calcium goes in opposite directions for loops and thiazide, also very different mechanism. Hypomagnesemia is the only effect that you're going to see on magnesium, that you're going to see with loops and thiazides. Again, a different mechanism behind the hypomagnesemia, but kind of same outcome. And all of the um, diuretics potentially could cause hyperuricemia, but you're really only also going to see it with loops and thiazides based on the effectivity. This concludes the video on the adverse effects of diuretics.